I'm Stephen Peros, and you're listening to The World is Wrong Podcast. We're here to tell you how the world is wrong. The world is wrong about Stephen Peros. <laughs> Welcome to a very special bonus episode of The World is Wrong Podcast. Our second season hasn't begun yet, but this is just a little taste for those of you who just have been going through August hungry for some World is Wrong content. I am one of your hosts. My name is Andras Jones. I'm Brian Connolly. And I conducted the interview we are about to hear, but it really came about because of you, Brian. Because You're welcome. <laughs> you, uh, you chose <laughs> the cat's meow as, uh, as your antidote to mank. Yeah. And we loved that movie so much and we loved doing that podcast so much that I guess that radiated out through the internet and Stephen Peros heard about it and uh, got in touch with us to say that he approved of our efforts. And then we had him on to talk about the Missouri breaks. But when I did that, I actually took some time to interview Stephen about the cat's meow because it didn't really make sense to talk about the cat's meow in an episode about the Missouri breaks, right? <laughs> yeah, that makes yeah that makes, Conser- makes sense that it didn't make sense. Yeah, yeah conservation of resources here. So I uh, I conducted the interview. Uh, is there anything that you want to say about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, is, is there anything you want to say about this interview that you heard uh, like six weeks ago, <laughs> eight weeks ago? Uh, no, it's just it's really good. Uh, it's, it's a, you know, if you haven't seen the cat's meow yet, watch it, listen to our episode about it, but then also listen to this. Cause he does get into some good behind the scenes stuff. Some really great sort of like what it was like to work with Peter Bogdanovich, which is really exciting to hear about. Yeah. Uh, no, it's a, it's a fantastic, you know, interview and it's a movie again, why we covered it. That's not really talked about and there's not some fancy special edition Blu-ray of it. So this is the only way to hear some good behind the scenes about this movie. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and Stephen Peros is just a really, really smart guy. And it's great to have been able to document this little insight into the creation of The Cat's Meow. So uh, oh. why don't we just... You were about to say something. Did you have anything else you wanted to add to that? Oh, just if anyone ever wants to remake, hire him to write the script for Mank and it will be a better movie. <laughs> if any do you say remank? Yeah. <laughs> You're are you actually encouraging a remake of Mank that you call that's called I'm remake? A, a re, I, uh, let's start a petition called Remank and we're going to make it cuz there's a good movie that could exist there. I, I want to see we should produce Remake the Musical. Remake <laughs> exclamation point the musical. I like it. I like it. <laughs> okay, uh well enough of this enough of this nonsense, Brian. We have we got to get serious about this movie with Stephen Peros and we'll be back next week for season 2 of the World is Wrong podcast. But first, Let's go to this conversation with Stephen Peros. Time passes. Welcome to the World is Wrong podcast, Stephen. I'm happy to be here. And you have heard our episode about the cat's meow. And afterwards, you reached out to us and it blew our minds because we were just so excited to that uh, <laughs> it registered with you. And we love that movie. But... As much as we try and get it right, we know that that's, it's impossible that we got it completely right. So I'm just, I'd like to invite you to correct us or highlight anything that we got right that usually people get wrong. Oh, uh, well, you know, it's, you know, the reason I found out about it is I think years ago, someone said, oh, you know, you can, you can basically be your own PR representative to, you know, put your name in Google alerts and then they'll, you know, let you know if anything pops up where they're mentioning, and I put the titles of works that I've written and and produced, had produced, I should say. Uh, And so this came up. So I said, uh, oh, let me listen to this. Uh, And I don't have immediate recall on anything that that bumped me. In fact, if anything, I have recall on how impressed uh, your guys' deep dive into the movie was and listening to 
I think you mentioned um, interviews I'd given at the time, which obviously are all floating around the internet, uh, podcasts and things, and talking about the alternate uh, the casting, which actually connects us to uh, to uh, the film that we're going to be talking about on a uh, on on the episode. Um, the Missouri Breaks. Brando, who was originally attached, I don't know if you actually, I don't know, did you wind up mentioning that Brando at one point was uh, wanted to play Hearst? Oh, no, I did not know <laughs> that. That's amazing. <laughs> well, what happened was, you know, we went through a lot of Hearsts. Um, uh, the one person who was attached uh, almost right up until uh, he wasn't <laughs> close to when we were going to shoot was uh, Christopher Plummer. Uh, who, of course, who would deny Christopher Plummer's an, an extraordinary actor? At that time, he was he was old then, which was 2000 when we shot it. Uh, and he had just done three films back to back. And when our film kept getting bumped and it turned out we were going to be shooting in uh, Germany and Greece through, you know, having the cast, I think, show up uh, essentially first week of November and staying through staying through uh, almost right up until Christmas, like the 23rd. Um, he just said, you know what? I don't know if I can do it. I've done three films. I'm kind of tired and I really want to spend the holidays with my family. Uh, and I, I didn't mind so much because it was very important that the age difference between Hearst and Marion be right. Uh, and there, uh, I think Hearst was 62, Marion was 27. People you know, saying she was 23, but she was 27. And and Kirsten was younger than that, and and uh, Plummer was older than that. And I had a concern about I didn't want to impose any more creepiness to the age difference than was already inherent. The good news is when we finally landed on Edward Herman, who is someone I always saw in my head while writing it, when they said me when they that they finally let go that they needed a star for Hearst, and that was when Kirsten Dunst came on board and Lionsgate did the numbers and said, okay. We don't need a star. We just need the right actor now. And I remember the, the my producer, who's also had, had been a casting director, Carol Lewis, said, what do you think of Edward Herman? Because I'm going to suggest him. I said, oh, my God, I was think I thought of him for Hearst when I researched it, when I first researched it. And that age difference, because Ed Herman, I think, was 59, Kirsten 18. The, the age difference is actually the same age difference, just both of them just about three or four, three years younger, four years younger. So uh, um, I always say about casting the kind of the right pe the, the wrong people got out of the way so the right people could do it and um, I'm thrilled with the cast we had but but so Brando getting back to Brando so at one point Peter tells me he just got off with the agent or producers or somebody that that Brando read it and, and wanted to do it um, now we have no doubt at that period he, he wanted to do it you know whether it was that he loved the script or whether he wanted the money I have no idea but everybody was kind of like Oh, Brando wants to do it. And all everyone started talking about was how difficult Brando is, in particular lately, how overweight he is, the madness on on the, the sets of the last two or three films he had done, whether it's Don Juan DeMarco, you know, uh, 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 whatever the film was, whatever films. Are, uh, and uh, but I remember Peter and I, we just look at each other and just say, or we were on the, actually on the phone at that point. I, we, we know all this. But it's Brando. <laughs> That's all I kept saying. <laughs> yeah. But it's Brando. Like the opportunity just to be in part of Marlon Brando's filmography. Um, in the end, I just think it went away somehow. I think either reality, it wasn't, I, I don't know if it was in a, we turned them down, we stopped hearing from them, we just moved on to other people. But um, but eventually we landed on, or, or we got Kirsten, and then it didn't, and then once we got Kirsten, we said, we can't put Brando and Kirsten. I just that just is wrong. Um, and so Kirsten was literally it, this movie that I had, uh, you know, registered with the Writers Guild in, in 1990, finally getting, you know, right out of college, finally gets made, you know, in and out of uh, possible productions, three to four different producers, uh, almost got made a bunch of times. For, uh, and then finally, finally, it's greenlit because an 18 year old says yes. That, you know, the, <laughs> everybody's. Uh, the, the the fates of not only me and this this project ten year old project at that point, but you know a crew of forty to sixty to eighty people the the lives of all these it's impacted because an eighteen year old who happens to be hot at that moment and has nothing booked before the start of the next year wanted to do an adult role you know she just come off of Bring It On 
and um, she wanted to be, to, she's here, she is being offered. And the, by the way, Kirsten was not somebody who came from us, from, from our, our brains. It didn't come from Peter or me or, or my producers. It was, I believe, one of the execs at Lionsgate, I, I'm, and I don't want to say which one it was because I'm not sure, uh, who was on the phone with an agent of, or, or a rep, agent manager of Kirsten's chatting. And then he's sitting there thinking, wow, we're still trying to fill the role of Marion. I'm chatting with someone who reps Kirsten Dunst. And he pitched it too. Uh, and then then we then so it was kind of a, it was kind of coming to us as Kirsten Dunst wants to do it and we want you to say yes. <laughs> and so and Peter was no fool. He also thought Kirsten was what was good for the role, as did I. So it was um it was great to get her. And she dedicated herself to the part, totally dedicated herself. She knew she was young. And so she, on her own, took movement, uh, went to a movement coach, went to a voice coach. She wanted to make sure she came across not as a kid, but as an adult. And I think she did a, a wonderful job opposite uh, Eddie, opposite, obviously opposite uh, Ed Herman. Um, and the maturity, this this maturity just came through, which is sort of where we all got exposed to her with Interview with a Vampire. There's something in her that brings out this groundedness that's that's kind of fascinating have you followed her career since then oh sure yeah yeah she's absolutely she's become a really really interesting i mean she was but she's be, she's continued to be a really interesting actress yeah absolutely and and uh, career directions on you know unexpected um she's you know f fairly without vanity um uh just a you know just a real approachable um person uh, i had a great time you know i was on set the whole time i was in greece and germany i sat next to peter uh in my chair next to him he had he had no ego about having a writer on set in fact he wanted me on set he's at the point in his career where he didn't see a writer as a as some sort of creative threat and as a writer you know what your what line you don't cross you don't suddenly start talking directly to actors you don't start you know, you, you observe you and anything you have issues or thoughts about, you say into the ear of the director and let the director do their job. Um, and you and, and, you know, Peter thought, OK, well, here I am. I'm going to be in, in, in the strange land in Greece and Berlin with 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 this cast of 14 uh, and, and all these historical characters. Uh, of course, I want the guy who sort of has lived with this, researched it uh, and who also likes Daisy Miller. <laughs> to, to be to be on set uh and so he actually made sure that i was on set um you know there was a it wasn't of the lowest of budget it was about six and a half million but you know every dollar counted in having the, the expenses of a writer on set and also the theoretical uh uh added time you know I, everyone fears that if you have a writer on set it's going to add time because now suddenly the writer's going to always be chatting with the director and that's going to eat up to i'm giving them a new suggestion now we're going to do a take we we wouldn't have done had the writer not been on set mm -hmm. but it never works out that way i mean it never works out when i'm on set whenever i've been on set um you two or three days in whatever producer was skeptical always comes over and says i'm so glad you're here uh so it worked out great we came in on time and on budget even though we lost three or four days of, because of crazy crazy torrential rains when we were in greece shooting all the exterior um uh, boat scenes um in Glen. i remember when we came over we all flew into athens and then had to either go by car or a bus which the crew did to this little tiny town called kiparisi on the on the eastern shore not to be confused with Kiparisia, which is a bigger city on the west, but Kiparisi, and the reason was we needed a, a, a town somewhere close to, where was the closest coastline to Berlin that had somewhere where we could have a, a, a port that we could, uh, that could be both, that could, where we could um, have the, where they disembarked and where, uh, where they embarked and disembarked. So two distinctly different docks that could fit a 200 foot steamer. And so the Greece coastline is very similar to California coastline with hills kind of going right up to the ocean. Um, and so and so that's where we were. But when we, when we came in and I came in on this uh, on one of these uh, little ferries, little houseboat things, and there was a storm, huge storm. And it's ferries rocking back and forth. And first thing I see is this because you're coming in at night, it's dark silhouette of a ship and lightning flashing. 
and 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 they had already done the art di- direction on the yacht. So I just saw W R H stenciled on this this uh, mm-hmm. uh, the the whatever the steam the steam whatever they call that thing, and um, and it was just like Hearst just making himself known, like. I don't want you here making this movie. <laughs> uh, but uh, but we got there. We got there. It was a tough journey. And then rain r- rained us out of three days. Um, and then I had a, and as a result, because we had a hard out on this shoot of December 23rd, everybody had to go back for the holidays and everyone was going to England and or the US or, you know, New York, L.A., and you can't bring people back after the holidays. It's just ex- exorbitantly expensive. So we had to finish the film by the 23rd. So I was asked to cut 15, 10 pages or 15 pages from the remaining pages of the script. Because we went to Greece right in the middle of the shoot. Wow. They came back to Berlin, just the way it all worked out. So I cut, I think, about, and then combined or rethought a scene, um, all of which I'm happy about doing. And I think I got to 10 pages and and I was giving Peter thoughts about the other five. And he said, um, um, you don't have to cut any more. 10 pages is fine. I'm going to finish the fucking picture. You don't have to get, forgive, forgive the, 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 the colorful language, but I wanted to quote Peter. <laughs> yeah, no, no. F- colorful <laughs> well, language finish. is encouraged. Yeah. Yes. Well, well, uh, and sure enough, we did. And, uh, and one great example of that is the scene where first where where, where Marion uh, realizes that Hearst knows about them and go and goes into Chaplin's cabin and he's looking at the shoe and he's thinking about um, the gold rush and a comedy scene and he says uh, basically it starts with her walking in with uh, if you're starving would you eat your shoe then they talk um, then they fight and then they reconcile and then they're then they're they're on the cabin starting to part each other now that if you really watch it is a two and a half minute single take. It's one camera move that goes from two shot to close up to another close up to wide shot. And the idea was, let's, you know, Peter's like, I know, I know how I'm going to, the, the creative ways I'm going to shoot this movie to make sure I finish this movie. And so it's the only thing he shot a, a lot of takes on because he generally didn't shoot a lot of takes because you, because when you shoot a two and a half minute take, there are a lot of variables. Did someone go up on a line? Did the cameraman bump? You know, a, a, you know any sorts, any number of things. But we got it. And so that's ways that Peter said we don't need to cut anymore. And he and he was able to, and he's always been a fairly economical filmmaker. His, it's that's his his mentors were. He doesn't shoot more than he needs. Uh, he shoots like John Ford told him, shoot so it can only be cut one way if the film was ever taken away from mm-hmm. you. Um, so yeah, it was it was quite the experience. Well, that. Uh, let's let's dig in a little bit to the process with Peter Bogdanovich because he seems like I don't know if he was who you imagined to direct this, but in retrospect, in the same way with Edward Herman, like I miss Marlon Brando being in this, but mm-hmm. I love like this. I think this is maybe I haven't seen everything Edward Herman's done, but mm-hmm. this has to be one of his greatest performances. Thank you. It really is. He's really quite extraordinary. And he, he, he was hired only 10 days before the shoot, I think. Um, it makes uh, sense. Like I, it, it's written yeah. for a heavy, it's mm-hmm. written for a movie star and to see Edward mm-hmm. Herman completely devour the role makes you think, well, maybe, maybe he's been ill used by the industry. Maybe he yeah. could have handled more than two or three scenes yep. in every film in the seventies that needs a, a millionaire. Yeah. He, He's a huge history buff, you know, and, and obviously it's it, it, he has a great a track record. You know, he did the, I think those two, two TV movies in the 70s where he played FDR so brilliantly. And he's done a lot of historical characters and he's just a history buff himself. He reads and reads and knows. And um, so he came in knowing a bit about hers. But it was interesting for me as a writer and also as as a director, I've directed two independent films. I went to NYU to be a you know full filmmaker. It was it was real, it was very, very um powerful for me to be on set with, you know, an ensemble of actors, you know, uh four of whom are, you know, arguably believe can, can say that this is their movie because it's an ensemble film and you can see the film as Marion's movie, as Chaplin's movie, as 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 Hearst's movie and as Ince's movie, you know. Um and all and the actors all had a different method. And it was fascinating to see Peter essentially doing what, 
you know, Kazan's method is, which is whatever works. Oh, I, this actor is very needy. I'll coddle them. Uh, mm -hmm. This actor needs line readings. I'll give them line readings. This actor, you know, needs room and, and wants to uh, be a little looser with the lines. I'll let them whatever it takes to make sure that they come across well on screen. Because whether you're a film critic or just someone's mom or dad who just casually watches, the first thing you see are the actors. And that's the first thing that comes across. And that's what registers and keeps you watching. So you've got to give them the room to do their best. And Eddie, and I remember Eddie, um, um, Edward Herman and, um, and uh, Jennifer Tilly were, they do the script. That's what they do. That's mm -hmm. their job. They do the script. And unless something is really abhorrent to them, they don't. Um, so for Ed Herman to come in 10 days before the shoot, that made a lot of, it was great. I think that was helpful to him to just say, that's what I'm doing. Um, Eddie and Kirsten, you know, they know their instrument well and Kirsten does. And, and they, they wanted, they wanted to say less rather than more. And so some of it was trimming it back. Uh, Eddie had a philosophy behind that. He said, you know, and, you know, that's the thing for me is here I've been spreading my research for 10 years across all these characters. Now you get Carrie Elway showing up with a binder just about ints. Mm -hmm. And so these guys, so now they've taken all they've done since they got the role is research, maybe even beyond what I have researched. So I, I would be a fool not to listen. And Eddie made a good point. He said, you know, I feel like this was written more from the point of view of the verbose chaplain who, who, who emerged in the sound era as opposed to Chaplin, who was, was not yet someone who had to depend on his voice, maybe someone a little bit more close to his, uh, you know, poverty stricken London roots, maybe even a little Cockney slipping in now and then. Um, and so I wound up, uh, I wound up pulling him back, uh, pulling him back from, and, and, you know, a good comparison is to look at the text of the stage play from, it's published by Samuel French, and you'll see a lot of, um, a lot of the dialogue is 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 a little bit more florid than he is in the uh, in the movie. So I, you know, and, and then uh, then it was just interesting to see all the different ways actors uh, how you're how to work with actors to bring out the best of them, and to just really watch Peter. You know, I went to NYU Film School, which was a great film school, but I have to say that that shoot and being on set for that shoot um, was a was an extraordinary film school. Oh, I bet, and I guess yeah. so. The thing about Bogdanovich and the reason, you know, the reason we cho we we stumbled upon doing the cat's meow was in part inspired by Brian's uh, reaction to Mank, mm -hmm. and one of the things we talked about a lot in the episode was how even though Orson Welles is never mentioned in the cat's meow, his ghost hangs over the film in part because of the story and in part because of Peter Bogdanovich. And so that's one of the things I'm kind of curious, just is that something that you talked about? Is that something that you were aware of or are we just projecting? No, it's a good uh, here. Well, what happened was I, I first heard this story as uh, at NYU film school in the history of silent film class with the, the, the late great uh, historian, William K. Everson. And, uh, and I became fascinated by it. I, I held on to it. But my favorite film, uh, I think, well, one of the, I think the greatest fi American film is Citizen Kane, and I love Citizen Kane. And so I said, well, you know, even though I was fascinated by this specific two-day weekend story, and I love uh, historical pieces that that uh, that don't try to run a, a cradle-to-grave race through someone's life in two and a half hours, I like how can you get the essence of someone by just experiencing them through a weekend. Um, I thought, well, you know. Everything has sort of been said, but as I researched, you know, how do you compete with Susan Kane? As I researched um, Hearst and Marion, I realized, wow, Orson Welles was correct in his preface to the times we had the the posthumous Marion Davies uh, memoir, uh, when he basically apologized for his naivete and said he had no idea. You know, the, the, he feels he did, did a disservice to Marion's memory that people think that Susan Alexander is Marion. You know, he certainly was inspired by the story of Hearst and Marion, but that that, that he, he wanted to make a work uh, that worked dramatically and, and a, a fiction and that people believed that she was some no talent gold digger was not, you know, it worked for the story of Citizen Kane, but not for uh, as in fairness to, to Marion. So once I realized that they had not been properly depicted on screen. 
um, I realized, okay, well, then there's room to do it. In fact, there's one scene, I, if I had to pick one scene that Peter and I had uh, different opinions on, it was the scene where Hurst is running around trying to find Marion. And he runs into her room uh, and he finds the little wrapped gift package of, of the harmonica, not realizing it was a gift for him. And he thinks this little affectionate message is something uh, that she was going to give Chaplin. And, uh, and, and he starts smashing it, you know, um, and chipping away at the wood, I think he even says in the script. But I did not. I distinctly didn't want it to be a room trashing scene because that's mm -hmm. in Citizen Kane. Um, but Peter felt it should be, a, a, you know, I, I, it does. I think I was more I didn't want the comparison. I, it, it is organic uh, dramatically. For for uh, for him to do what he does and trash the room, but uh, but I just was concerned about the, the comparisons to Citizen Kane in that moment and and uh, so. But other than that, we didn't really talk much about it beyond beyond that. Peter, um, you know, remembers that it was something that was supposed to be in early drafts or uh, of Citizen Kane, and that his that that I think the the quote it may be apocryphal is that. Part of why Orson Welles cut it out was that he believed that that William Randolph Hearst would have shot and killed and covered up a murder uh, on his yacht, but he doesn't believe Charles Foster Kane would have. And that's, you know, points out kind of the difference between the two men, the historical character and the and the, fic the fictitious one. But yeah, but once that was out, we never know, not on set. There was never any discussion or mention of Wells, like, unless we were in some moment where Peter was holding court and telling tales separate from this movie. Although the good that the Orson, the Orson Welles story he told once I was out uh, when we were in the, in Berlin. Peter rarely went out uh, at night or or hung out with people. You know, directing is, if you don't already know, is very exhausting. You need yeah. your sleep, need your energy. So Peter didn't go out like a lot of, you know, all of us were strangers in a strange land. So I was sort of adopted by the actors and. You know, I'd go out to dinner or, or or hang out at the bar at the Kempinski and have drinks. But I was out one night for dinner with the British with a few of the British actors, and um, and the expression "the cat's meow" does not exist in in England. And so one of the actresses who plays Mrs. Barham, she said something like, "You know, I just feel like the title is a little twee, which means a little too cl cute." Or cu and I was trying to explain to her what it meant. And another British actor was agreeing. He didn't like the title. And then Peter was uh, one of the red eyes. Peter was out to dinner. I think it was business. Someone was in Berlin who he had to have a business dinner with. And he stopped by our table. And Peter, Peter, they, they're, they're talking about the title. He said, I'm going to tell you a story. He said, the Cat's Meow is a perfect title. I'm going to tell you a story about why I know it's a perfect title. He says, when I was doing um, Paper Moon, it's based on a book called Addie Prey. And at one point during the, the, the making of the film, I said to the producers, in the studio that I wanted, that I think the better title would be Paper Moon. And they said, well, well they were very nervous about that. Said, you can't call it Paper Moon. You know, the book's called Addie Prey. And he's like, yeah, but it's not a bestseller. We're not going to lose anybody by changing the title <laughs> from Addie Prey to Paper Moon. And they're like, well, what does it even mean? And da 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 da. And so Peter got a little, he's a little concerned. Am I making the right, right decision by, by pushing this? So he called Orson, who was in. Europe, so it was a long distance connection. And he said, and I called Orson, I said, Orson, I, I want to ask you a question. I, I, I'm i thinking of a new title for my film and I want to run it by you. What, what's that? And he said, I, title, I want to run a title by you and tell me if it's good. All right, go ahead, tell me the title. Paper Moon, what? Paper Moon. And Orson paused and he said, that title is so good you can just release the title and forget the picture. <laughs> <laughs> so that that that's Peter's explanation for why Cat's Meow was a good title. So he said we should, that, so that's uh, the title stuck, and I always love that story. Um, so uh, I don't know how I got on this track, well, but yeah. So working with Peter was I think you were asking me about working with Peter. Uh, you know, I'd heard stories of of, of quote unquote difficult Peter or or of all those Easy Riders raging bull tales. But Peter had been past all that. He'd been up and down, both professionally and personally. And when I met him, you know, um, 
he 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 is he was he certainly uh, was a, a strong personality, someone who um, uh, believed in his choices and decisions. But he was much much more open to listening to and talking with other people, and especially if he identified you as an aide, as someone of, of help to him. He was somebody is somebody um, who, uh, kind of by the lesson of his mentors. It was uh, coddle your actors like their like their like their favorite aunt or uncle. Um, uh, be like David Lean. Be f uh, friendly but not familiar with your with your keys because they have to know that you are in in a you are going to you are their boss. Um, you know your DP, your production designer, etc. Um, and and give the look give the look of fear to your producer every time they walk on set so that they know you better not be walking on here. Uh, 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 you would not be hanging out here unless there's a a reason. So they 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 are very careful coming in, and you know you don't want to make them feel like they can sit next to you too and keep giving you suggestions the whole shoot. The time for that was oh is over once principal photography begins. And um, uh, and for me, like I said, he ident identified me as as an ally, as someone who was going to help make his vision better. And that started because he got involved a good year. Uh, I think it was. It might have been late 98. So I was going back and forth chatting with him. He wasn't living in L.A. at the time. I was in L.A. He was in New York. I visited a couple of times. I'm from New York, so I visited him face to face. He was in L.A. We'd visit face to face. So we had already gotten very familiar. We knew that it wasn't about my movie versus your movie. It was let's both make the best movie like it was a child we're taking care of. So we never had one argument. Uh, we had well-reasoned disagreements. And then one of us went, oh, OK, that makes sense. Um, so yeah, it was a great, uh, it, it was, um, a, a terrific experience. I, I, it sounds like something that you're proud of. I hope it's something that he's proud of. I think it's a really, for a director like him to be able to work with what looks like a great deal of economy mm -hmm. and, and, uh, yeah, it's just like, I, as you said, it's a, I'm sure it was a film class for you and watching it, you can get a real sense of mastery from oh yeah but he was shot, it was like 30 31 days two countries a yacht period and you know he's 59 at that time um when he when we made the film uh yeah it is a film he's proud of we we communicated just recently about mank uh via email and once again you know because we were talking about how i, I shared with him a bunch of links because mank came out and that led to um there's a you know a lot of people who either reviewed Mank and, and brought up in, in, um, um, Cat's Meow extensively and talked about comparisons or wrote articles or, or even did a show like yours actually singling out Cat's Meow as a reminder to people about a better depiction of Hearst and Marion. So I wanted to share those with him. And, you know, he once again reiterated we made a good picture and, and uh, yeah, he's proud of it. I think he's really pleased with how the film came out. Cool. Well, I just want to ask you one other question uh, about the the history, because mm -hmm. uh, I'm a big fan yeah. of Karina Longworth's You Must Remember This podcast. And as we're recording this, she's in the middle of a series about Luella Parsons and Hedda Hopper. And in that, and actually in the most recent ep episode, sort of synchronistically, she referenced the the story not didn't reference cat's meow but referenced the ince hearst chaplin mary davies story and basically debunked it said uh, there's no way this could have happened because luella parsons was already or at least the luella parsons part of the story could never have happened because luella parsons was already well in with hearst by the time this happened now it's mm -hmm. not your responsibility to be historically accurate but i'm just kind of curious if you have anything to say about that um well you know when i first researched this it was pre-internet uh and so i researched you know uh autobiographies particularly as a as a as a writer you want to be able to get their voices and luella's written wrote an autobiography where essentially she says at the beginning you can't believe a word anybody says um <laughs> And Chaplin totally lies about having been on the boat when everybody he knows, including his DP and all sorts of people, have said he was on the boat. Um, uh, and and I've been told for at least at least a couple of years, oh my God, you have to listen to Karina Longworth's uh, podcast. And I'm just not someone who has yet um, made it a part of my 
my daily thing to, to listen to podcasts, although I would love to be that person. I, I don't know how I know so many people who have a whole bunch of podcasts to listen to, a whole bunch of, you know, serialized shows that they've binged or that they've seen all the movies. I'm like, I have no idea how you balance this all. But so I haven't. But I made it a point to listen to the, the first two parts of that Luella Parsons up until she mentions this. And 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 all I can say, and I'm happy to li- listen to more of Karina Longwith, um, because I've been wrestling with historians opinions ever since I did this, which which is um, deciphering facts takes imagination. And the, particularly for a period where people didn't really record much, write much. Um, and uh, and if, if, if it wasn't that, they actually controlled what was left behind, the paper trail left behind. So I have seen Historians hold up a piece of paper and say, well, this couldn't have happened because look at this piece of paper that says I've examined the body and it's free of all wounds and nothing could have happened to him. And I say, well, do you see who wrote it and signed it? It's a yeah. INS employee or a Hearst employee. So, you know, there are people still you read a biography and they'll and I'm working on something about Rita Hayworth and it'll quote Rita Hayworth. And they're quoting Rita Hayworth because of something that was in a press release. We're not realizing. That that press that quote in the press release is not something Rita Hayworth said. It's something the marketing department at Fox, I mean, at Columbia, came up with and put in her mouth and put quotes around it because it serviced the needs of the film. It's not actually what she said, but so they hang on pieces of paper. There's a photograph of her, and so therefore, th- th- that is not conclusive. And I'm always amazed at two different types of people with their reactions to the cat's meow. I'm always amazed at people who conclusively know for sure this isn't the way it happens. And I'm also amazed at people who say, you got it right. That's definitely how it happened. I don't know how either of them are so sure. I'm certainly not. And that's why Eleanor Glynn is the is the sort of, in a way, unreliable narrator um, and says, uh, you know, this is the whisper told most often. Um, uh, she can only, uh, she sort of is, is the, is is me in the sense that um, I can't say I've ever found the smoking gun, but I feel like every time I opened a door, I could smell the smoke of the gun that just left the room um, when you add everything up. So, yes, I, in the end, I was listening to that carefully, and I realized she didn't actually point up per, per, very specific reasons. I think she said that there's an earlier from 2018 yeah, uh, on Hearst and Davies where she goes a little more detail. So I'll, I'll seek it out and listen to it. Uh, but again, I'm always amazed that anyone feels so um, so darn sure about what happened on a yacht that that no two people can 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 agree on who the guest list was. No paparazzi was there. Uh, the DA never actually of San Diego never actually did an official investigation. And then when they said uh, we've done a pre investigation, decided not to do one, and they only questioned two Hearst employees, uh, Dr. Goodman. Um, uh, and I forget who the other person they they questioned. Um, and they never even named Hearst in their in their report. Uh, look, even Karina Long within that episode talks about Hearst and Luella being concerned about. Um, oh, I'm blanking on his name. Um, Will Hayes mm-hmm. and the Hayes office, forgetting totally that I don't believe Hearst was ever worried about Will Hayes. That Will Hayes was the what she fails to mention is the former National Republican Party chairman. Hearst had just gotten a president elected. <laughs> I don't think he was ever afraid of Will Hayes. This notion that he was afraid of Will Hayes, I mean, I, I don't see any evidence of it. So again, I, I think she has a, a a a lovely show. I'm glad that it's attracted the audience. Clearly, she does a lot of research. She has a nice voice, and obviously a lot of nice, you know, so it's easy to listen to. Um, um, it's well produced, but you know, I, I don't think she's some new arbiter of the facts. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I that's, I, cool. if I, if I could paraphrase, it sounds like you're saying that perhaps the world is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good place to start from is the sure. world is wrong and mm-hmm. then let's explore. As you said, if those who, those who are entirely sure Mm-hmm. about something that there's no way to verify. Right. I mean, that's why <laughs> mystery endures to this day, because it will always remain a mystery. Dear listener, if you are just discovering our podcast, 
You can find all of our episodes on our website at theworldiswrongpodcast.com. You can also write to us at contact at theworldiswrongpodcast.com or follow us on Instagram at theworldiswrongpodcast. And now, back to the show. Hi, I'm Brian. And I'm AJ. And we have a podcast called The Director's Wall. Examining a filmmaker's career, film by film. First up was M. Night Shyamalan, then Francis Ford Coppola. Who's next? Is there anything to this whole auteur theory? Find out on The Director's Wall. Subscribe via Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or your preferred listening platform. Andras here. When I'm not co-hosting The World is Wrong podcast, I'm hosting and producing the Radio 8 Ball podcast, where we answer questions by picking songs at random, like picking musical tarot cards. We've hosted musical divinations for people like John C. Riley, Patricia Arquette, Tig Notaro, and Fred Armisen, and hosted over 200 songwriters providing the randomly chosen answers from Inara George and Dan Byrne to Mose Allison and Alan Toussaint. That's Radio 8 Ball, all one word. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts and download our app from the iTunes App Store. Show. 